I am absolutely honored and privileged to be here with you today, and more importantly, with this crew of awesome guys and girls up on the stage this morning. That's okay. You can clap for them. That's good. Yeah. There you go. That's all right. Would you all do me one of the greatest honors and favors of my morning and stand so that we can pray together the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for allowing us to gather in this space this morning. Uh, God, with you. God, we feel your presence here. We feel the power of your spirit in this place this morning, God. God, and I just pray that you allow us to rest in that. With all the uncertainties that are, that are going on in our world right now, God, we lean into you. God, we love you. We trust you. And we pray these words in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand I start to fall And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on and There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground Friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now There was Jesus In the wait, in the searching In the healing, in the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus. This man who needs amazing kind of grace for forgiveness and a price I. So I thank God every day There was Jesus There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching In the healing, in the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces i 
This group is in good hands. They're wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. I want to give you a report upon our, on, on our leader. I just spoke with him about half an hour ago. I think if you follow Facebook at all, you know that he is self-quarantining right now along with Tammy. Um, evidently, Micah came down and tested positive for COVID-19 on Thursday of this past week. Uh, fortunately, all her symptoms are extremely mild. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any, any issue there. Um, Scott said he and Tammy are healthy as horses right now, but they are self-quarantining for 10 to 14 days to make sure that everything's okay. They have not been tested. Uh, he says he may go ahead and do that this week because they're still in that, that period of time. But, but he's doing well. She, uh, Tammy's doing well. Scott's doing well. Micah's doing well. I think the two dogs are probably ready to <laughs> leave town. Um, because if you know Scott, Scott's probably scrubbed the kitchen floor about 12 times in the last 18 hours. And he's got all sorts of little projects going on. So hang in there, Scott. We'll see you soon. But get, get well, you and uh, Tammy and the entire family. Well, we have been looking at Matthew chapter 24, which is a really, really interesting chapter in, uh, in, in the Bible. Um, a lot of people don't like to read chapter 24 because it, it can be an ominous chapter. I mean, there's a lot of warnings, and a lot of like sirens and bells going off, uh, sort of warning us about where we are headed and what's going to take place. But he begins to describe, Jesus begins to describe what he calls the end of the age uh, to his disciples in this chapter. And when we get to this 24th chapter in verses 21 and 22, we see a lot of this stuff going on. The, uh, the age, if you will, as discussed and mentioned in the Bible, is the period of time between Jesus' birth and his second coming. So right now we are living in this age that, that he talks about, this, uh, this period of time. And last week we looked at a number of verses, including verse number 15 of this chapter, in which Jesus says this. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be looking at the 15th verse of chapter 24. And he says this, So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Now, as we said last week, different interpretations abound. They're all over the place as to who or what this desolation is that Matthew talks about in this, in this gospel. Certainly, there was a Syrian king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, who, had, who did actually, he, he committed an abominable and horrendous act by sacrificing a pig on the sacred altar within the holy temple in Jerusalem. But that occurred prior to Jesus even being born in Bethlehem. Then it, later, the Roman Empire lay siege against the city of Jerusalem during a period, a brief period of Jewish revolt that took place. And this took place some 40 years or so after Jesus' death and resurrection. And this um, action by the Roman government caused untold suffering, and it resulted in over one million Jews being killed and the temple of God being totally destroyed. So some people, very learned people, see the Roman Caesars as the abomination that is described here in, in chapter 24. And last week we talked also, but there were some noted reformers and Protestant pastors, well-known, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, and and even John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, they considered the abomination that causes desolation not to be any of those. They thought they, it was the Roman Catholic popes that were in charge from Vatican City. So you can see that scholars, commentators have been all over the map, all over the place, trying to determine who this person, who this kingdom that stands in the holy place that is this abomination 
In fact, scholars and commentators have been all over the place for years and years and years concerning everything that is actually written in this 24th chapter of, of Matthew. So if you read that chapter and you say, well, I'm not quite sure what it reads, join the club. A lot of people before you have felt the same way. But so serious is this event that is talked about here that it precipitates the greatest crisis the world has ever faced. And this is how Jesus describes it. So take a look at verses 21 and 22. He says, For then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Now, many people really have a rough time, and they find this very, very hard to believe. Because for most of human history, if you go back, and we go back through, through the history of, of humanity, it seems incredible to people, absolutely incredible, that humanity could sink to such a low level as to bring on a judgment that, like this, that is so onerous, so serious, so terrible, that it seems like humanity has sunk farther and faster than, than ever. And when you think about human history, go back 100 years, and I think if you go back 100 years from today, we have, as human beings, human history has sunk to a very, very low level. That should not be a surprise to us. But some people are very surprised because they don't see humanity in the same way that, that, that Jesus sees it in this chapter. You've got to remember one thing, that political leaders, leaders of nations, leaders of countries, only express ideas that have been lying half-hidden over the years within the human heart. And, and it's only been waiting for the right moment for these things to emerge and come and become public and become very, very visible. You know, go look at, at, at more recent period of history. Within the last hundred years, you had, a, you had a guy by the name of Adolf Hitler. You know, when you think about it, Adolf Hitler did not teach the Nazis to hate the Jews. He didn't teach them to do that. All he did was he expressed in very inflammatory speech and language the hatred and the smoldering resentment that was already felt by thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Germans who were really scarcely aware that they had these terrible passions hidden inside their own heart. What he did is he brought it out. It was laying in those hearts. He just brought it out and he unified that hatred and that unified hatred ended up in the deaths of over six million people. This evil has been around, and it's been in that human heart for all that time. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, if we really look inside ourselves, look in our hearts, we can see inside our own hearts attitudes and feelings which, which we have a rough time and we struggle with. You know what, you go back to the Old Testament... Our buddy Jeremiah, the prophet, had something very, very specific to say about the human heart. And he says this in verse 9 of chapter 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I tell you what, the world will not arrive at the point described in chapter, 20, uh, chapter 24, verse 21, until there's something removed from this world. And that's the restraining force of God's power. Remember a few weeks ago, we looked at some parables. One of those parables we looked at was the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weed, so to speak. And it was a look-see at both good and evil coexisting, if you will. The world is going to eventually arrive at a certain place. And, it's, and you really can see that when you go back and look at that parable. 
In verse 30 of Matthew chapter 12, we're told that Jesus said, let both grow together. In other words, he says, let both the good and the evil grow together. Let the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds, let it grow until the harvest. And then in verse 39, he said, the harvest is the end of the age. That's still to come. But until that time, good and evil grow and mingle together, if you will. But the prominent and dominant philosophy of the day is not evil. It's good. It's still good. I know when we look at the world and we look at current events, it may seem that evil is triumphant as we love our lives today. But despite all the injustices you see in the world, the terrible prevalence of crime and violence and rioting and looting and, and, and all the things that, that we seem to just get overwhelmed with on a daily basis, the scales have not been tipped in favor of that which is evil or wrong. It's not been tipped to their favor. The proof of that is that evil must, now I want to think about this, evil must still constantly disguise itself as good in order to survive. Swindlers and con artists take your money, but what happens? They try to appear respectable. They try to appear legitimate. Prostitutes want to be called ladies. Looters are not people that steal. They are feeding and caring for their families. Of course, they're using their own judgment in order to do that. Today, tyrants are often posed as benefactors. Liars appear or want to appear to be truthful and legitimate. Cheats and abusers perverts, and a host of others hunger after respectable titles as they go through life and they go through society. Only good is still really acceptable to people. Because when you think about it, evil must disassemble itself and appear what it is not in order to gain acceptance, in order to, in effect, triumph for a period of time. And that's proof that pitted against the massive power of evil present in the world today, there is something. It's an even more massive power for good. And it still exists in this world. You and I, mankind, humanity, often lives in open rebellion today. But mankind also lives in guilt. A lot of guilt. Because mankind knows within his and her heart that they need God. They may not, they may never, they may fight that to their grave, but there is a yearning in their heart. They may deny it, but, they, but it's there. And you know what? In their hour of need, a lot of those people end up seeking God and finding God to his glory. Even those in theory deny the existence of God in practice take great pains to disguise their evil, to make it look good and moral and just. So evil is under restraint today. And it's under restraint and it's hemmed in by forces for good. You know, over the years, the majority view has been for truth and justice with evil, in effect, in the minority position. That evil is powerful, but it is still controlled. It's forever breaking out. It's sort of like the balloon that, that keeps moving and bubbles out in different places. And you see it as cruelty and you see it as violence and you see it as injustice, both in nations and states and in individuals. You see it in homes. You see it all over the place. But it is ceaselessly being beaten back and overpowered again by good. Now, this accounts for the brief optimism of many who profess faith in what they call human goodness. Human goodness. Now, that's not what I read, just read in Jeremiah chapter 17, but there's a ton of people that call the human heart basically human goodness. 
And in their blindness, if you will, in their ignorance, they, they ascribe and give credit. They give credit to this overpowering abundance of good. They give the credit to mankind himself. What they do is they completely reject the biblical revelation and truth that goodness stems not from within man, it stems from the kindness and the grace of God on our behalf. That's where it comes from. In, in his darkness, mankind views good almost as an inherent trait of human behavior in the human race. One thing Jesus does, he reveals truth everywhere you turn. He says in the end of the age, he says it's going to be different. He says then evil will reign in triumph. That's what we just read. He says all bonds will be broken, all restraints will be cast aside, and there's going to be lawlessness that's going to fill the earth. Terrible catastrophes are going to sweep through. But he also says that even with all that, mankind is not going to repent. They're not going to come to him. Fear will not drive men and women to prayer. Basically, what he's saying is it's still going to drive people even more and more to defiance. They're going to take no delight in good, but they're going to be made happy by the triumph of evil. It's going to be their calling card. This time frame is referred to as a time of tribulation, if you will. Lasting seven years, when evil and catastrophe have their way in the world. You get into the book of Revelation, you read portions of it, you're going to see that picture exactly stated in the conditions that the world will be in at this point in time. So the question we have is, what is it that restrains the enormity of human evil that we see in the day? And, and as I say, it's gotten worse and worse over the last hundred years, at least based on what I see. You know, what force is it that prevents the world from really disintegrating or falling apart right now? Let's go back to an earlier chapter in this gospel, chapter 5. Go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Because in that sermon, Jesus said to this little band of disciples that were following him, ordinary men, fishermen, tax collectors, probably did some farming, but very, very plain and normal men. And he said to them in chapter 5 of Matthew, he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. It's an important thing to say because by that phrase, what Jesus means is that they were light because they had life. In John's gospel, we learn that in him was life and the life was the light of of men. Men have light only when they are in touch with the life itself that comes from Jesus Christ. And in addition, he says that they were salt. And the purpose of salt is what? The purpose of salt is it prevents and it holds back rotting. It holds back corruption. For centuries, men and women have used Salt to keep meat from spoiling. It arrests meat from becoming rotten and rancid. So Jesus said they were as salt pervading society, in molding human thought, challenging the evil that was in the world, restraining evil, controlling evil, limiting evil, resisting the march of evil in human affairs. It's for this reason that Christians really must not isolate themselves from society. I think way too many Christians think that they've got to create, if you will, Bible cities or Bible communities. You know, these are talking about like Christian communities that, that set themselves off from the world. They get away from the world. They get away from the flow and stream of life around them. It's not where we should be. Christians are intended by God, to permeate every level of life. Christians are salt, but salt, when you're thinking about it, is no good if you leave it in the salt shaker. You've got to use it. You've got to use it for its purpose. 
So we shouldn't be setting up our homes in Christian communities where only Christians live there and no one else. We need to be in the legal field. We need to be in the education field. We need to be in the science field. We need to be in the, in the field of business. We need, to be in, we need to permeate all areas of society. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church about the committing the coming of the lawless one, he said this. He says, you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. So the restraining force mentioned by Paul was something that these Thessalonian Christians, they knew about. They had experienced this. They only had to look inside their own lives to see what restrained the lawlessness within their own hearts. Because they knew that the desires of the flesh were in competition with the desires of the spirit. They knew that the restrainer of evil in their lives, the restrainer of evil in the world, is the Holy Spirit of God. It's the mystery that Paul calls Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the life of Christ imparted to each and every believer by the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit acts as a dam against the manifestation of evil, which is everywhere. Then Paul added this in that very same letter to the Thessalonians. He says, the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who, holds, who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. So what Paul's saying is all restraints must be removed before what man is without God can be fully revealed. So the question is, when does all that happen? Let's look into the crystal ball. When does it happen? Well, you're going to be disappointed if you try to tie it into some specific date on the calendar. You know, Jesus continually, continually warned against any attempt to set a date. You know, it's really crazy when you think about how many men and women have tried over the years to predict the date when Jesus so clearly said, don't waste your time. Truth is, he didn't even know the date himself. It's only known by the Father. So if Jesus hasn't been given that information, I'm sure that the Heaven's Gates cult some years ago saw themselves is going to have that information because they were going to come. Remember the hail bop comet? They were all going to get on the comet and, and, and move on to the next dimension, if you will. Well, that didn't work out. You go back to the Mayan civilization, some people felt they had figured that the day in which the world would, the end of the world would occur, and that didn't happen either. Back in 2011, a man by the name of Harold Camping calculated the age based upon his study of hundreds upon hundreds of Bible passages. And he predicted that the end would occur at 6 p.m. in each time zone on May the 21st. That's my birthday. <laughs> and at least I could have celebrated until supper time. I've celebrated a few birthdays since then, so I don't know what he was looking at. So we know how that prediction turned out, and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. You, you, the, there's always something coming out, it seems like, every month where someone comes up with the answer to that. You know, this scripture in the 24th chapter of Matthews, as well as, as passages you read in Daniel and Revelation and 1 Thessalonians, and a number of others, they describe conditions and corresponding events that many people use the term, and they refer to this thing as the rapture. And that rapture has been defined as the coming of Christ for his church, for all his believers. And it's in conjunction with all the events that we have been describing here that we see in this chapter 24. All the believers, dead and living, to be taken up from the earth in the blink of an eye, to be caught up with Jesus in the air, 
to spend eternity in his glorious presence. That's basically the definition that you'll get if you think, look up the word rapture. Now the word rapture comes from a Greek word. And that Greek word is harpazo. And you, if you translate harpazo from the Greek to the Latin, you get the word rapturus. And from rapturus, we get the English word rapture. And it means something. It means to take forcefully. It means to snatch, to be caught up. It's found in 1 Thessalonians. So this is what Paul has to say in, in that letter he wrote to that church, starting in chapter, uh, verse uh, 16 of chapter 4. And he says this, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, if you like exciting things to happen and you want to get a lively discussion going on, ask people what they know about eschatology, which is a really a fancy word that means describing, and it's a study of the end of times or the end of age events and how they relate to the scriptures of God. Now, at this service, also at 9 o'clock and 1045, I mean, we have a ton of different faith backgrounds that come and worship here and that, that log on online every week on their computers, their tablets, and their phones. And they come from a variety of faith backgrounds besides Methodism. Because some of you, I know, are, have a Catholic background. You were raised Catholic. You've attended Catholic church a good part of your life. And I know who you are because when we used to do communion up here, you crossed yourself. And I always knew what your background was because it was very, very apparent. Others of you come from Episcopalian. Some of you are Lutheran. Some of you are Presbyterians. We've had a good share of Southern Baptists here. Pentecostals. Tammy came from a Pentecostal background. Or we've got non-denominational backgrounds as well that don't affiliate with any mainline church. There may be a lot of people come in and this is the first church they ever attended. Here they thought it was a gym. Guess we fooled them. It's a church. So we have a mixed group of faiths that worship here on a regular basis. And if you've been a Methodist for most of your life, you may have never even heard the word rapture. You never heard the word rapture probably ever uttered in a Methodist sermon. And there's a good reason for that. Because the rapture is not part of Methodist belief. You're not going to find any preaching about the rapture. You're not going to see anything about its accompanying beliefs of a great tribulation period in the Methodist doctrine. Now, Methodists certainly hold to the coming of Christ. Christ is going to come. It's part of the Apostles' Creed. I know a lot of you have grew up with the Apostles' Creed. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. He is coming. It's part of the Apostles' Creed. And it is part of Methodism. You know, the early church and the church throughout the years did not subscribe to a rapture event where believers would be taken from the earth as, as we just read. That was not part of the early church. This doctrine of this rapture, it's relatively recent. I did not, not know whether you knew that. But it's relatively uh, recent. It was invented or it was brought up in the 19th century by a man by the name of John Nelson Darby, who was a former priest in the Church of England. And in his teaching, he introduced the idea that Christ would return twice. The first time would be, as we just read, to rapture his church in the air. And then he would come back after a seven-year tribulation period to usher in the physical kingdom, the Jerusalem-based kingdom on earth. And Darby based all of this on his interpretation of that passage I just read 
in the first letter to Thessalonians. Now, just to give you an idea of how diverse this subject is among Christian leaders, among Christian educators, among Christian theologians, among Christian denominations, consider this. Four years ago, back in 2016, a survey was taken that found that 43% of self-identified evangelical preachers embrace the idea that Christians will be taken up before the seven-year tribulation period, whereas only 31% of mainline preachers hold that same position. You know, the belief in a literal rapture is so ingrained in the thinking among some Christian leaders that only 6% of Baptist pastors, less than 1% of Pentecostal pastors embrace the idea that the concept of the rapture is not to be taken literally. Now, those are pretty stark numbers. But compare those figures with the fact that fully 60% of Lutheran pastors, 48% of Methodist pastors, 49% of Presbyterian and Reformed pastors think there will not be a literal rapture of the church as described by Darby. So we are all over the place as, as theologians, as believers, as people of different denominations or non-denominations. And it's not as though the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, ignored end of age or end of time passages. He did not. He wrote sermons pertaining to what we just read and what we just talked about. But those sermons, like nearly everything else of, that he wrote, they deal with how Christians are to live their lives right now, today, contemporaneously. What is of utmost importance is that we accept the free offer of the Father's salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the focal point. These other things are things we talk about. So when you think about it, I, don't, I have no idea where, you're, where you come from and, and, and what you believe right now, but with so many differing opinions and interpretations of the Scriptures by very knowledgeable people, learned theologians for years and years and years who have devoted their entire lives to this area of study, I'll tell you what, it can be a little overwhelming as you get all these opinions coming flying at you. But I want to tell you something. It's at those times that you need to remind yourself, I need to remind myself of the great truth that God has given us. And that truth is that in the end, God wins. God is triumphant. God is on his throne. And God has saved you for glorification whether there is a rapture, whether or not there is a two, sec two second comings, one second coming, don't worry about it. Get right with Jesus today, and the promise of God is he will hold your hand through all eternity because he is the victor. Evil has no shot at winning. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, this 24th chapter of Matthew is just, you know, just chock full of, of things that sometimes we just want to avoid and some things that we sometimes have a difficult time understanding. But Lord, chapter 24 is, is indeed a warning to us. It, it's, it's drawing us back to your love. It's drawing back us back to, to your character and your nature. It's drawing us ba back to repentance, to be right with you to live in you, to be with you. And Lord, as we take all this in and we allow that to just, so we to ponder that in our hearts, allow the Holy Spirit to just speak to us about today, about right now, about where we are in our relationship with you because that's really all that matters is who we are in you. We can get fooled by the world saying, oh, the human heart is kind and is gentle it's loving. And Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things. The human heart 
It's an evil heart. But Lord, when we come to Christ, we are given a new heart. We are a new creation in Christ. That broken heart is now Christ's heart, living within us, guiding us, molding us, shaping us. Lord, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. We thank you so much for the gift of your son. It's in the name we pray this all. Amen. Have a great today. Great day today and a great week this week. Take care now.